Barry, thanks so much for, for joining. Well, where are you right now, by the way? I'm in my South Beach in Miami. Oh, nice. In my house. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, um, we've talked a little bit about what does the future of retail look like? It almost feels like, you know, some, some people are saying this is a real body blow to traditional brick and mortar retail. But I'm curious, at a macro level, what, what do you think retail looks like on the other side of this? And by other side, I mean like 12 months out. Um, COVID clearly accelerated the restructuring of the retail complex in the country. And you know what you know will survive. In Miami, there's a mall called Val Harbor Shops here, which has Gucci and Prada and Brunello and James Purse and Valentino, and it'll be fine. I mean, those retailers are probably fine. Fine being they'll survive. And I think people enjoy this social experience of shopping there. You kind of wander from store to store. To store. I think even a mall as large as Aventura Mall, which is one of the largest malls in the country, most successful, I think it'll be okay. The shopping in some of these malls is, is still an entertainment, an outing. So like going to Disney World for fashion. People still like the tactile ability to try on clothes and ask their friends, what does it look like? And you know, you can return everything at home, but it's an activity. Just like everything in life is sort of an activity. So I don't think physical retail is totally dead, but it's kind of shocking. I mean, the, the, this was a tremendous blow to struggling retail. Rents had probably climbed too high in certain cities, urban markets, like even Manhattan on Bleecker Street, where people bought those assets, assuming rents, which were 1,000 a foot, they went 3,000 a foot, would go to 7,000 a foot. They may be full, but they're going to be paying 1,000 a foot again. They, this is a tenant's market. And now that the anchors are serially falling apart, and probably you have Macy's and Sears, what's left of Sears on their last breath. As you know, um, all the inline tenants in a mall can basically cancel their leases or rewrite their, their rent. And if these malls were bought at six yields or five yields or seven yields and you cut the rents in half and you had 50, 60, 70% financing on your mall, you're, you're, the, the mall's now owned by the lender. Yeah. And um, one thing I, about the mall business, it's incredibly capital intensive. I mean, you can, you can put in an Equinox and put in your theater and put in your restaurants, but it takes a lot of money. And the tenant has all the leverage because there aren't that many tenants out there. So I think, I think um, you know, the retail landscape is changing. Interestingly, we used to say, okay, we'll do restaurants. Well, the COVID restaurants are, uh, that certainly has also changed. Will you be able to go out to a restaurant? You know, I, my belief is this will pass. You know, I'm sort of an optimist and I think we'll get back to something resembling normal in 12 months, um, hopefully faster than that. Because otherwise, a lot of these restaurants won't open. The rents make no sense if you can only have 25% of your seats occupied. And right. you know, many places can't have an outdoors, right? Whether you're in New England, there's no such thing as outdoors between October and May. So um, it is really impossible to underwrite retail today. I, I, I do. I am. I was up in Georgia this weekend, uh, southern Georgia, and you know, the, the stores are crowded. Like every store's open, people are in them. They're not doing a great job of their social distancing and they don't have a lot of- And that's at malls, Barry? Well, I didn't see the mall. I was looking more at power strip centers, you know, large, large centers. I, didn't, I haven't walked into a mall, but right now the malls are, are it's kind of getting a false positive. They're very busy, actually. People are showing up. I heard this Dillard store that anchors a mall in Salt Lake City and Bobby Taubman said that the sales, when they reopened, were better than they were in the same week in 2019 even though they were only allowing so many people in the store at a time. But again, I think that's sort of like pent up demand. Um, and the fact that people have our home, they used to malls didn't used to be busy between the hours of sort of 10 and five when people were working, the only housewives and house guys might shop occasionally and kids were in school. Now everyone's home. So, and they do have disposal, some disposable income because the government made them grants and you know, they, they want to go shop and it's, it's just more fun to shop physically, I think, than shop online. Yeah. It's just, you, you shop online when you don't have any time, right? Now everyone has a lot of time right? <laughs> looking for something to do. So right. I think, you know, it's interesting. I think Amazon, you know, I've been fairly vocal about my criticism of Amazon. I, I, you have to ask yourself, 
example here, Jeff, when is enough enough? Is it really important to destroy every main street in the United States? You know, every town in New England that has a charming main street. We're gonna have a, what are we gonna have? Like a laundromat and a hairdresser, three restaurants and- A bunch, an of, bunch of banks. <laughs> yeah, but not really because one outcome of COVID, which I think will really actually be, will happen is a paperless society. I mean, we will use our, even I figured out how to use PayPal and Venmo, you know, and, and, um, and you, you know, I was just with a fellow who's a tech guy and, you know, he, he went and flashed his Apple Pay at the store. He never touched a piece of cash. Banks have a lot of ATMs. You don't need ATMs. Some of the outlets, the ATMs must have been a big business for banks. I mean, they charge you like three to six dollars for, for taking money out, pure profit. Um, I don't know why you're going to need as many bank branches as, as yeah. you did. So. I, I, and fintech is is racing at banking. Like, you know, why does PayPal exist? It's kind of like why did digital photography escape Kodak? Like, why didn't the banks develop their own PayPal? Why does that Why does that vertical exist? Why did Square not get bought by J.P. Morgan Bank? I mean, yeah, it seems like because they could get disintermediated too. You don't necessarily need the bank or Mastercard or Visa. Like, you know, you're paying, you pay, you pay on your card, and then. You know, there's a commission on top of that. So the system will sort itself out as it, as it matures, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure the bank is going to be the answer to Main Streets. And by the way, it's not charming to see those tenants on Main Street. You might have a jewelry store, I suppose. People still like to touch jewelry, maybe an art dealer. Um, although even there, you know, things like Artsy are changing the art market too. So, but what then and again, it's like, what are you going to pay in rent for that privilege, right? You might, you're probably paying a fraction of what you might have been to pay before and what do you think happens to main streets like what like what what is what is it depends, a main it, 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 you know it's going to depend why it was there and what's how big it was I, I if you're in sea island georgia people go shopping when they're bored with the beach and that retail will be fine right if you're in um a worth avenue i think that'll be okay i mean there's limited space a lot of tenants that want to be there um and those are marketing like soho even in all this, if you're an internet company, you know your clients. I mean, if they have one or two locations, they're going to have a place in Soho. Everybody launches sort of a trendy brand in Soho. But the rents, um, the vacancies are still high, and the rents are 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 too high, probably. And and um, the tenants have all the leverage. I, I think retail is, as a as a distressed investor, retail is the most interesting asset class, but also the hardest to underwrite. And and a lot of the retail space that you'll underwrite. You might be underwriting to scrape it. And then you have the situation in a mall, you might have a small tenant whose actual value is his lease, but he can he can keep you from taking the building down. He has no desire to actually run his store, but he will cause you just like that small um, townhouse that the, they built an office tower around because the guy wouldn't sell. I mean, you're gonna have to buy out all these tenants and, and that's expensive. So retail will be a, a, a challenge um there's hope but you know if it had to be entertainment focused before it, it's gonna have to be even more so now i do think the gym will be okay um i think you know tell me my base case is this is this will pass covid will pass and life as we knew it won't won't disappear we'll, we'll be social again we'll go to the gym somebody might sweat on you and you won't die on purpose you know i i, I think I think I think Americans have very shallow short-term memories, and um, that's our strength. We will move forward, and once the sporting games start playing again, and people go back to school, and college basketball starts, college football. I mean, I, I think we're an optimistic nation. Having said that, we're running into an election year this year, and that's going to be a that's going to be the next great digestive moment for the stock market going to have to figure out what it thinks is going to happen in this election because i think given the the wars in between the middle it's really between the two ends of the spectrum and um, you know a democratic sweep would be difficult i think for the stock market and could happen and if there's a second wave if this if this goes wrong this what i think is a required opening of the country it's going to be an interesting election for sure and it's going to impact everything i mean we, we could be in real trouble if, if this comes back like real trouble so and just i don't think that, i think that's a 10 10 probability but it's not zero yeah i and don't i'm just, not a doctor 
Well, you guys just priced a uh, SPAC last week, right? Um, yeah. What's, what's the plan for it? Like, what do you intend to do with that SPAC? So if your viewers don't know, it's a special purpose acquisition company. And basically I said I would do anything but part assets. I wouldn't do real estate assets in it. So we raised $700 million. We, we, we upsized twice. We had a billion and a half of demand. And um, we're, our goal is to buy a growth company, something that the market favors today that we think will be worth more in three, five, and 10 years. Does it have to be, is, is there any tech dimension to it or just any growth company? Um, any growth company, I think, you know, if you, if you want to, you want to, if a salmon wants to swim with the, with the stream, you know, and not, not upstream, the market loves growth. Tech capital light businesses are clearly in favor. The multiple of, of, uh, a growing revenue stream. One company we're looking at did like 125 million in revenue. And then this year will do 250 and next year, 400. It's sort of tech enabled platform it's in mobile. Um, those are the kinds of things I think the market is loving um, and they're not impacted by COVID. So um, in this case, probably benefiting from COVID. So I, I think uh, we're gonna try to go where the fish are swimming. Although um, I, I do think having something sexy, if you look at the last three big successful SPACs, they're led by Drack Kings, which was a huge home run in the public markets. And also, um, and the other they did what's called a pipe, which is a after the IPO, which was only $250 million, they did a $500 million private placement, essentially. So they got scale. We can do that as probably as much as a billion dollars alongside our 700 million. So we can have as much as a billion seven to buy a company between two and 8 billion, maybe. Um, and, and, and that's to buy a company. It's really an IPO for the company. We're not really buying the company. I'm, I'm willing to be a chairman, co-chairman, non-executive chairman, I, or a board member. I'm, my ego isn't in this. I'm trying to find the right company, and hopefully somebody that has a desire to access the public markets and take some chips off the table in an extremely volatile world. So that's yeah. what we're what we're looking for. And you know, I, I, when I was doing the roadshow, I mentioned a company that I, my family office invested in called um, Here. It was called Doctor Labs. I guess their property, their business was. Um, Pro, pro, programmable earbud and uh, it was started by a fellow from Brown where I went to school and uh, they had six offers to buy the company for a billion dollars I'm pretty sure he'd already picked out his house his Ferrari his Hawaii vacation home and three months later Apple came out with their earbuds and the next bid was zero and they filed so I think entrepreneurs have to remember that these these marks are paper marks in many companies especially the ones that aren't profitable and if we can give them a path to a certainty, to execution of an IPO. They know they're gonna get done and we can help price them so they don't have a silly IPO discount from the underwriters and they don't have to do a shoe, which can also be very expensive for the company going public. You know, I think um, it more than offsets the sponsor equity that, that we get for putting the company together or the deal together. So um, we're looking forward to that. It's uh, more the activity of my family office and my firm. It's not related to Starwood, it's related to me. My partner is a fellow named Joe Dowling, who was the CIO of Brown University and the CEO of the pension plan. And he was the number one performing CIO in the country last year, and I think top 10% in three over five years. And he's a personal friend, and he's going to do a lot of the due diligence work, and, and I'm just helping find the opportunities for him. We have, I think, two years to find a, a candidate, but hopefully we'll find one very shortly. And um, it's sort of fun. And I'm curious to get your view as someone who has just so much domain expertise in hospitality. This has been obviously brutal for the hospitality industry in the short term, but even pre-crisis, you know, the, the threat of the short-term rental economy and Airbnb economy was already impacting hospitality. Like, what does, the, what does this crisis do to the, the, the competitive dynamic between hotels and short-term rentals? Um, very big topic, lots of answers. So, this broadly on the industry, uh, you know, we, we have the one hotel here in South Beach and, and we were, we had people who were booking for months because they wanted to get out of New York for the coming COVID crisis. And we probably were 45% occupied at pretty good rates. Um, and people stopped booking because they were afraid they'd get stuck down here. You know, people would come for a week. And the government shut the hotel down on a Friday. We fired 1,700 people that night or the next day. 
And you know, that felt like a taking. That's like eminent domain. We were happy to stay open. They forced us to close with no, um, you know, reparation. I don't even own the hotel. I just manage it today. But that feels sort of semi-American. Um, but I'd say that the last thing to come back in this crisis will be the big boxes. You know, I saw they're going to try to have every other seat at a craps table in Las Vegas. The big box convention hotels. I mean, if, if your tech world is telling people to work from home until the end of the year, you think they're going to send them to Vegas for a convention with 500 people? So Vegas, New Orleans, Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, New York City, big convention, big meeting, hotels, tough. Air traffic. And if you're flying internationally, they're not even going to have flights, it looks like, till the end of the year. So if you're to rely on international traffic, it's going to be tough. So the thing that comes back first is domestic travel and roadside, you know, where people will be driving. And they may be driving a lot this summer to whatever destination they're going to. It would be good for campgrounds and for camping. And um, that's probably the perfect COVID vacation. Um, so uh, Airbnb, you know, Arnie Sorensen, the CEO of Marriott, estimated that he thought that the all these companies combined were like a couple points in occupancy for the country. And he might be being optimistic, and maybe it was as much as three or four. If you count the number of rooms on Airbnb and the inventory, some of it was just reorganization, as you know, the inventory. It was already out there, but instead of being in 30, 30 different areas, it was under one umbrella. And they bought a lot of guys, right, and put them together. So it wasn't all incremental inventory, but there was a lot of it. And I think, it, you, as you know, it never really penetrated the business market, the one stay night traveler. It was more like my son who went to the Rose Bowl and rented a house instead of taking eight rooms at days in. That was pretty popular. And it was always a factor for vacations, for like week-long vacations in Cabo, whether it was Airbnb or any of the companies that did that, which were used sometimes, you know, 20 years ago, where just one guy had 20 houses he managed. He just found it on Craigslist or something. Um, what I found is that if you produce a really good product um, and you create an energy in the asset that you can't get in someone's apartment, if they care, you do fine. So our, our New York City hotel, the one Central Park, was running like 93, 94% occupancy and 170% market share. I couldn't see any discernible impact from Airbnb on that property. We were full. Same was true of Brooklyn, Miami, for sure. We were making close to $44 million there when the when COVID, and we were up $6 million year over year through February. And then uh, boom, zero. So I think it puts a great burden. The same thing is true in retail. The retailer has to stand for something. I think Warby Parker's success in physical is that you want to go to that Warby Parker store. It's kind of cool. And that's why Warby Parker was, last I checked, they had 90 stores and were on the way to 300. As you know, he was buddies with the guy from Allbirds. They wanted to do 300 stores. Sweet Greens is expanding in physical space. Amazon itself is going into physical space. So physical isn't dead, but it's only going to be populated by brands that mean something. There's generic brands that somehow filled the mall uh, that didn't really say anything. There was no reason to go to, I'm making it up because I'm not a, a, a Lane Bryant or big and tall. I mean, there were some strange brands that were developed that don't have any emotion to them. So One Hotels was a mission-driven brand. And I think that drove uh, loyalty and occupancy. We're a luxury green brand and, and we had a fan club and, and we still do, I think, although they're home. So um, I, I think Airbnb is a real company. I think it's, it was an excellent, and as you know, it was quite profitable. Um, I, I, thought, I thought they had a strategy they, they could have adopted that they didn't. We won't talk about it because maybe someday I'll be involved. And, um, and I think... Um, I just think as a cohort, it's sort of age related to, as you know, the propensity to rent in Airbnb is goes up with, with the youth and ends with my mom. She's not doing it, right? She's, she's, she's 86 and she's not going to someone's house to save a, a nickel. So uh, it's a real force. I don't think it's the end of the hospitality as we know it. I do think that the, the, this COVID, how, how we recover and whether we do legislate contact tracing, it could be a while before business travel recovers to anywhere near the levels of 2019. That, that's going to be a challenge. I mean, I, was, I did a road show for the SPAC virtually, right? I used to have to go to six cities in over three days or whatever, and um, or eight days in logistics and travel. I mean, it was sort of a really nice way to do a road show. Right. And um, we, we launched our newest fund, which is our Fund 12 at Starwood Capital Group, 
and we held a webinar and had nine billion dollars of capital on the on the line at night, you know, both in Asia, in um, in the Middle East, and in the United States. So um, it's definitely, I mean, Zoom. Even I can use Zoom. So um, and maybe I'll use the Facebook version of Zoom. But um, I, I do think it will impact on the margin. What percent of business travel? Five percent. Yeah. 10%, it's enough to hurt the business travel hotel, I think, for the for a while. And going, so this is God. <laughs> and going from business travel just to regular way business, like for companies, um, what do you what do you think is the long term impact of everyone operating their companies today over Zoom and remotely in January of next year? Like, do you think companies are going to well, go through this? I love our, our Zoom call, but I wouldn't mind seeing you in person. I mean, I kind of like, I kind of, I like, you know, it's funny. I was, I was talking this morning. We we're working on something in Germany. And, and the guy um, that's helping us, who is a member of the government, um, I met him on a, at a conference and we, were, we went on a hike. Yeah. And you can't do that in a Zoom call, right? I mean, there's, there's certain human interactions that you get from going to things and meeting people and the randomness of it. Zoom is sort of anything but random. And maybe I'm just my age, you know, I'm, I'm the tail end of the baby boom, but I, I think we are social animals and we, we would like to see each other in person. And, and so, but on the margin, which is all we're talking about, like, you know, this the margin, yeah, it, it's, it's got to affect travel. It's got to affect business. I don't, I think it's Dorsey who's taken both of his companies and said they should work from home forever. Um, I don't think that's works. I mean, I can't, I couldn't run, I wouldn't feel comfortable running my company with everybody home forever. I, I like to see them. You learn from your peers, just walking around, talking to them. What are you working on? Oh, why are you doing that? Or, oh, that's interesting. Or, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just, I prefer that. I just, I, I don't want to work from home. I, I like changing scenery. I have a nice house. You can see it behind you. <laughs> I just don't want to be here all the time. So, Maybe some people do. And again, it's, we're talking on the margin because how does that affect the total, the total demand point? At least in the United States, we're growing as a nation. So, you know, we have three to four percent, three to four million people we add a year. So it's, it's even going to be worse in the Western European economies or China, which is turning over and Japan, which are aging. And if you have an aged economy where you have people over 60, it could be worse than it is with the youthful American or Indian economies, which are, you know, if you're older, hmm, do I want to get on a plane? <laughs> maybe right. I'll just, maybe I'll just zoom. I, I it's going to be a while before you, it's like Netflix. I don't imagine that there people will continue to uh, stream every show they have when they get back to work. Um, but I imagine that zoom and zoom equivalents are be here for, for good now. Yeah. It's, it certainly, it certainly has changed the business of, of asset management, right? Just the amount of, the amount of travel that, that was required. Um, and like you said, you can get on a call and connect instantly with. Yeah, but, but you can do that. I, and I, we'll see, because you're going to raise the fund or you raise the funds and I do the same. We can do that because we've, we've met them in person. You know, they know yes. us. And I don't know if it's the best. I don't know how I'd feel. Maybe. If I had never seen the person or got to ask them the questions I wanted to ask them or really, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. You know, my, your guess is as good as mine. Any, everyone's guess is equal. I, it, I, don't, I don't have a, I don't know. It's an interesting point you said that Zoom is like anything but random. And it's true, right? Like there, there's no serendipity in, right. hey, you should meet this person. You should connect while you're in town. Like that doesn't happen. Um, it happened. So I went to the, I went to this conference. We went on a hike. I invested. I met one guy. and invested in his company. It's a tremendously successful unicorn, almost a unicorn right now. You know, and I never have found this person, right? Right. And I'm like, what do you do? And it's like, and that's the beauty of sort of going to dinner parties and going out and traveling and going to conferences and talking to interesting people and people outside of your comfort zone, not just in my world, real estate people. I. I know most of the real estate guys. I, I like to meet, you know, mix with myself with experts in other ex, in other verticals. And and, and I, I've been um, locked down here in Miami doing some social. But like Eric Schmidt rented a house like eight houses away. So we've seen each other. We chat. You know, we come to dinner. And I, I could zoom with him, but we choose to chat, right? Right. And um, 
and you know, and that's that's. I, again, I, I think there are some people, I have friends who are not seeing people, mostly in the Northeast. And I think the, if you have that lens of being, experiencing this in, in New York City or the tri-state area where it's been worse than any place in the United States, I think you have a slightly different view of this and you'll think things will change much more, much more negatively, I think, than the rest of the country would, would suspect, I think. What do you think about, um, you know, there's been so much about hotels. I think this will accelerate technology adoption in hotels. Things like um, door locks. There's no reason we should give you a key card. We have yeah. to change every door lock, right? Because most hotels don't have smart locks, right? Things like elevators. You don't want to push the button. That technology exists. just needs to be adopted on a regular cycle. Um, I, I think you'll see a lot of uh, more automatic check-ins, especially at the lower-end hotels. So taking out opportunities to infect everyone, <laughs> yeah. right? And um, in the meantime, we'll probably staff, uh, and hotels, it's interesting data because I just asked our guys to run it for me. We, we are gonna run full service hotels, like limited service hotels, you know, for a while. And um, so they'll have a lower cost structure. We can probably cover all our operating costs in the mid thirties occupancy. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't cover debt service probably until we get to 50 or 60 percent occupancy, as high as 65. If it's a union hotel, it's going to be even could be even higher, and because uh, of the cost of union labor, and, and we're sort of holding rates semi constant here, from which is a big leap of faith. Well, the return on, to make money for the equity, you're going to have to run these things higher than 60, 65, and and uh, hold your rates. So that's the math. And, and that means there's going to be lots of carnage in the hotel industry. A lot of soft, soft hands. I have a friend here who's, who's built like his family company has built like 10 hotels, each one financed with a family partnership of friends. And they don't have the money to keep coming up and paying debt service and real estate taxes and insurance. While interest may have been for, for, bear, for born, it wasn't forgiven. It needs to be paid. And well, the hotel's not open, right? And nobody's paying, nobody's cut real estate taxes. The only people who think your property dropped in value are the banks, not that the, the municipalities are not lowering their real estate taxes or the insurance companies lowering their insurance, even though there's nobody in the hotel to get injured. So yeah. it's a, it's not like it's, I'm on the board of Estee Lauder. I mean, when, when sales go to zero, it's not like you break even, you lose a fortune. And um, that takes deep pocketed guys in the hotel industry. And, you know, we sort of forecast three months, four months of closure, not nine months, not a year. If right. that happens, all hell's going to break loose. And, and you're going to see cascading bankruptcies in retail, too, you know, of the, the debt securities that were used. And the, the, there will be a lot of reshuffling of who owns what in retail and the same thing in hotels, probably. And one of the things that I, I've been surprised by just reading the headlines is people are saying the housing market is flat or in some cases out, which just <laughs> doesn't stand to reason. Um, <laughs> What, I mean, maybe to unpack that question, one, there's all this talk about virtual viewings. Is anyone gonna buy a home virtually? Not at par. <laughs> 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 you know, by the pound. Um, I, I, you know, there, I, for a long time, Fairfield County, Connecticut was kind of dead on its butt. And, and you, you could list a house for sale and stay on the market for two and a half years. Um, there was this huge movement of the youth wouldn't move to the burbs. The wives wanted to stay in New York. Nobody would move to Connecticut. It used to be when you had a kid, you moved to Connecticut. There was grass and trees, and you went to even a public school, which you can't really easily do in the city. That Then those housing markets completely disintegrated. Like houses in New Canaan that sold for $8 million sold for two. Yeah. Right now, that those markets are quite strong. People are, 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 are fearful of the congestion and density of New York. And so Fairfield County, Long Island, those... There's tremendous demand for rentals. And so that might be one of the few places where housing prices are rising. I, I wouldn't, I just saw some data. I don't, I don't think housing prices are really going up anywhere. Um, just like rental markets, both in office and apartments have sort of plateaued. You're gonna see, it's kind of like, where it's, it's like Indianapolis where the pace car's out. Pace car is probably Mnuchin, Powell and Trump sitting in that car with a big yellow flag, you know, saying it's a timeout. We don't know where property values are going. We don't know what's going, where rents are going. Nobody's really trying for rent increases during COVID. And we did sign a lease. We have a 
a spec building we're doing in Raleigh. We just signed a lease for 175,000 feet, which I thought was pretty good. I don't know if they actually saw the space or not. To answer your question, there's one interesting thing that's happened, which is unprecedented, which is what we know about. But uh, the government said you didn't have to pay interest um, on your loans. So people who could didn't. And uh, right now, 4.1 million people have foreign interest on their loans. And it's something like a trillion, $980 billion of paper where they're not paying interest. And we have a non QM, non qualified mortgage uh, business. And so these are. Um, it's fascinating because they're supposed to pay it back in month four, but they're going to tell you, ah, I got to, can I spread it out over 12 months? Or some of those people will enter negotiations with you. Uh, we, you haven't heard a lot about that, but, but there, and the, the movement in the blue states of which you live in one or not where you are at the moment, but where you normally are and, and New York, you know, this move to non-eviction, you can't, you know, can't kick anyone out forbearance of, I mean, you, 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 it sounds like charity and, and good natured. It's actually going to cause irreparable harm to the financial system if these right. guys don't show up and pay their mortgages. And, you know, I, I, if you ask me one thing I, I worry about, I really, we'll get over COVID. This is a flu. We'll get over the flu. We'll, we'll come up with a medical breakthrough. The, the schism, the split in the country, the, the blue getting dark blue and the red getting really angry, violent red. That is really worrisome. And the implications for the property markets, for tenants' rights versus landlord rights, the, the, it, it, that is a seriously long-term issue. And you're going to have this election, which is going to put like, a, uh, it'll be like a mirror in the sun. It'll be like glaring. I mean, there is no middle candidate here. You're going to choose between two ideologies that are far from each other. And I know Trump fairly well before he was president. This is a program he's created for convenience to get reelected. He's not, he's not this far right. He never was, but it, he really wants to be elected and he has an unmovable block. That 40% has been there for three and a half years, ain't going anywhere. And uh, all he needs is a little bit more in five states and he gets to play around in the White House again for four years. And, and uh, he's not going to take the risk of going to the middle and alienating those people, even though and if he let go of the environment stance he made up or pro-choice, which he conveniently made up to, to get the, the right, um, it's not, you know, Donald's not religious. Nobody can say he's ever gone to a church other than for a funeral. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of sad because it's driven. I mean, it makes Obama look like uh, the, you know, his tenure, which I you know, had its own issues with the, the, the nice era for American politics. This, this is becoming, terrible and terrible for the real estate markets i think it's very very tough this populism of, of the you know the the millionaires and billionaires now went to anyone who owns a rental property <laughs> which is like you're taking advantage of your tenant that, that's some there has to be a voice on the other side that that starts talking some truth into this because what the good news of the of the crisis has been there's no real social unrest but there could be if this you know if this lasts much longer. I mean, it would, it would, it would, to some extent, it would, it would shock me if there isn't, right? Um, you've seen everywhere, homelessness rates are rising. Um, you think about the, the 08 crisis and that spawned the Occupy Wall Street movement and the Goldman, you know, Goldman Sachs just put out a report saying that unemployment can be 25%. I mean, it would be, it'd be shocking, right? If, if there wasn't some some social arrest on, on some order that, that, that starts to play a, a role in lots of these discussions. Like the, the what's the, um, the rent, uh, hashtag rent strike, right? Like that's, a, that's a, a real thing. And I think it will vilify landlords to, to some elements of the, of the electoral base. Um, one of the things I'm curious to get your take on, we've, we've looked a lot at sustainability, right? And sustainability and lowering the carbon impact of the building is, you know, on the one hand, it's just good business. Um, on the other hand, in, in cities like New York and Los Angeles, you're seeing these new carbon neutrality laws that basically say you have to be carbon neutral by X day or we're going to institute fines. And when we were looking at this trend, what we saw was that, you know, while most red states are red, if you looked at a, a voting map, it's usually like a bunch of red counties and then a blue dot over the major city. 
Um, so a lot of the cities are actually, you know, blue and correspondingly green, you know, when it comes to sustainability. Do you think we're going to see more emphasis on carbon neutrality and sustainability and a greater level of focus coming on the real estate industry and its role in the climate crisis? Uh, yes, but for a different reason. Um, and, you know, the, probably the single best outcome of COVID is if you saw today, carbon emissions are down 17% across the world. 17%, that's just massive. And, and um, you know, we're still pumping gas and, and, and oil. Maybe it's 90 million barrels instead of 96 or whatever the number is. It's not like we've shut down our fossil fuel industry. Um, the reason it's going to change is the reason everything changes. The capital is, is paying attention. You know, being ESG fund today is like uh, almost mandatory. Um, and for the first time, I can say that, that, that the money behind real estate, the big money, the big pension plans, the sovereigns, this is something they want to do. It's a check the box kind of thing. And um, I do think that will continue. That was going to happen with or without COVID. COVID has nothing to do with that. It's going to happen. Um, because the money cares and the money wants to check a box. And, and, you know, I think just like in hotels, I mean, one hotel was started to be uh, uh, a sustainable luxury brand using recycled materials and local labor and farm to table. And, um, and it was, it was started from the, you can't find plastic, no single use plastics. And we try to abandon and we try to keep paper out of the hotel. Um, I think, I think people care. Interestingly, it's a shift. You know, the interesting thing about Donald's reelection is the thing that would do him in or make him successful will be if the kids don't vote. And if the kids, the kids, the propensity to vote goes with your age, right? The older you are, the more likely you are to vote. And we don't vote very well as a nation in the aggregate. The numbers are quite low compared to most democracies. But the, the propensity of 18 to 24 year olds to vote, I think is like 56%. Those kids, the millennials care about the environment much more than my mom. My mom cares, but not the way the kids care because they got to inherit this planet, right? If they vote, if they came out and voted, given what's what, how thin this election margin will be in these five, six swing states, um, it would be a game changer for the Democrats. And it would be a game changer on the environment, right? I mean, an issue that doesn't have anything to do with anything. Part of me really hopes they do that, you know, they, that they that we get the government to, to align itself with the rest of the world on an issue that's obvious to most people. And it's kind of like believing in God. People ask my position on the environment. I'm like, OK, so we spent an extra three dollars because we're going to cut carbon emissions. And maybe it, maybe it wasn't that. Maybe it was a, some nuclear some something hit the earth. Right. But if we're wrong, we spend an extra three dollars if we're right. And it matters. We have a, this is we have to do this. We have to save the planet. We have to do it now that you're running out of time because you're hitting the tipping point if you haven't already hit it. So it's not like God, you know, it's like if you if you're wrong, you believe in God. I mean, to me, it's a universal moral code of behavior. It's right. What religion teaches you, and and I think the environment is the same thing. It's like we're that's why we call one hotels. We're responsible for each other. It's one world, and we are. I mean, look at you know when they when they and and it's interesting China has gotten serious. I don't think they got serious because they really believe in, um, I'm not sure they believe in climate change as much as they were, they looked at their air, saw it was filthy, and people were, they were asphyxiating themselves. They used to joke that China would dominate the world except they're gonna choke to death. Um, it, it turned into literally a reality. I mean, some of the air in, in Shanghai and, and Beijing was unbreathable. So necessities, the invention of all change, I guess, they had to change and they, they are changing. You know, they're, they're shutting, not fast enough, but they're, they are moving away. Look at their acceptance of Tesla. You know, yeah. they, they, that country to skip carbon cars, right? Skip it entirely. And that's probably why Tesla trades like it does <laughs> more valuable than every other car company on earth. Um, so I think this carbon neutrality thing for this, I, I, you know, I think ca California is its own country and, and it, it's been way ahead of the country, but the rest of the country is catching up. And we're building, you know, certified lead certified buildings, and we're building lead certified hotels today. It's sort of a given. And and last question, Barry. So so, 
when when from a uh, kind of real estate standpoint in the sense of like people doing meetings right business meetings in office buildings like what when are you and i sitting down in a conference room again realistically what's the earliest date you think that is i miss you brandon um <laughs> i mean come to nantucket we'll sit down on the beach uh <laughs> I'm going to open our offices. I think we have offices, two, three offices in New York, three different subdivisions of our company, and uh, here in Miami, San Francisco, London. Domestically, we're aiming for sort of a June 1st opening. We're gonna we're gonna make it um, Greenwich, Connecticut. We're gonna make it voluntary. About our survey showed 25% of the people are kind of uncomfortable coming in. That's fine. They don't have to come in for a while and. Uh, but I want to get back to the office. I want to have those meetings. So if you're in New York, come visit us. I'm not sure I'm going to go to New York this when I'm, I will be in New York this summer. I'm not sure when. Right. And um, you know, normally I wouldn't be in Miami in, in May. So, um, but I, I I I do think people will go. I, but again, I'm I'm approaching that magic six zero. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> so I, I would ask the my my kids and 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 people. You're what? Are you 40 yet? No, I'm 38. You know, it's interesting, as you mentioned, I did this back and um, we did these Zoom video calls and many of the people we spoke to were in offices. They were not home yeah. and uh, they chose to go. And I have people in, down here in Miami who are going to the offices. Now they're, they're 20 feet apart, but there are a lot of people who want to do the opposite of what you do. And not everybody gets to hang out in Park City. So God bless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I think I'll just come to your office there. Well, yeah, exactly. We can do some biking out here. <laughs> yeah, All right. I got I to gotta hop. I got a rescue finance package. I got to talk to the guys about. <laughs> All right, well, that sounds important. Barry, thank you so much for joining. For someone else, but we're the, we're the, we're the savior. Thanks. <laughs> nice to be with you today. All right. Thanks, Barry. Take care. Bye-bye.